Hello, I'm Hal Cruttenden and welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. How are you today? Uh, I'm fine, actually. I've had quite a busy day. I've done a play reading today, so I'm feeling very artistic. So I'm feeling very upbeat. It's been very good. Um, Because I'm going to Edinburgh to do warm-up my stand-up show but I'm doing a play during the day and I've done a play for five years so it was great very good yes can you tell us a bit about what the play is the play is called Brexit (laughs) and we we had discussion today because I'm playing a character that's sort of an amalgamation of I mean it looked nothing like these people sort of Boris Johnson Jacob Rees-Mogg and Michael Gove so I'm the big Brexiteer on this show called Brexit um and um and they're telling me whether I should shave my beard off. And I'm going, but I really need my beard for my solo show because it's my thing now that I've got a beard. So, yes, we've... So, yeah, I'm, I don't know. I'm still deciding whether for art. What you, what you should do is probably just do a poll online to see whether it should um, yeah. remain or leave. Is that- <laughs> Yeah, should the beard go? That's what my agent said. I phoned him and said, for the beard, I'm a Remainer. <laughs> oh, God. But yes, no, yes, it's, um, it would divide the country too much. We can't have another poll like that. No, we can't. So you, um, you started off life as an actor all the way back in 1983. You were on a TV series playing a schoolboy um, along with Anthony Hopkins, Sir Anthony Hopkins. I did. I God, I, I worked with some great people. I, I retired at 13 and then went back to it. And actually, because I went, oh, I don't like this anymore. It's horrible being a child actor. No one really likes you. And you're sort of getting in the way. But I had a brilliant time on a play I did. You haven't heard of a film called Another Country, have you? Yes. Well, I was in the original play of that in the West End when I was 12. Rupert Everett, Kenneth Branagh were the two, when they were 21 and 22. They were my mates. They weren't really my mates. Kenneth Branagh was very nice. Rupert Everett was a bit aloof. But it was great because there was only one young kid's part in it. And it was all, when I was doing it, it was alternated between me and Alex Lowe, who's now Barry from Watford. Do you know? He was the other guy. He was 14, I was 12. He did half the week and I did the other half. And um, I've never had such a long run in the West End since. I was 12. It was brilliant. Brilliant. That's fantastic. And then in the 1990s, you're in things like EastEnders and Kavanaugh QC. I did. I did bits and bobs, but not enough on TV to stop me going into stand Because <laughs> I was doing... Um, it's acting is the thing I found about acting and it was like it was a couple of years after leaving drama school that I went I started doing stand-up and if acting had gone really well I wouldn't have done and yet stand-up is now absolutely my main number one love so I'm sort of torn um yeah it's it's weird it's because I sort of I was lucky to find it because I never even thought I could do stand-up um but I was forced to by going, I need to... Because f- no, this is what nobody... People are shocked by this. It's a better regular living right. to be a stand-up than to be an actor. Actors, you could get a job as an actor and have a mortgage and not, then not work for two years. As a stand-up, you'll always have clubs. You'll always have things. Once you've reached a level, you'll always have work. And... Um, that appealed to me when I was desperate for something solid when I was mid twenties and wasn't getting much work as an actor. I was getting odds and ends, but you know. That's it because um, you know the, the sort of TV shows and films come and go, but you know people always want to laugh, don't yeah. they? Well, they always want to. Laugh. Then there's also there's you've got some control because it's your show. Yes. No, what you're not waiting to be cast in something. You are always creating your show, and you know if you all you have to do is reach a level that's good enough, and you are you're sort of there for almost for the rest of your life unless comedy com- I don't think all comedy clubs are going to die I think they've gone downhill a bit yeah. um, but I I'm lucky enough at the moment not to need clubs so much I do odd gigs you know, like this and I'll do comedy clubs for new material but I mainly make a living off trying to do my own tours and corporate stuff so it's so yeah it's quite nice in that way but if that all falls apart there'll always be clubs <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, there's clubs and your own things and you're an actor as well. Well, hopefully, yes, hopefully now. The last acting job I did was my own radio series, so I wrote myself that part. It's called Hal, had the main part, it's amazing. I gave myself the best part. Um, but, yeah, that was my last acting job that I cast myself in, so I'm very pleased to be doing this, this thing. It is very... If anybody's in Edinburgh in this summer, come and see the play. Mike McShane's in it. Um, Who signs it anyway? Whose lines it anyway? It's Mike McShane, yes. And Timothy Bentick, I can't say the name properly, Bentick, Bentick. But he's, da- he's been in the Archers for 30 years, he's David Archer. Um, and everybody who's a fan of the Archers goes, it's David Archer! And I said to him, I've never, seen, I've never listened to the Archers, I'm so sorry. And he went, no, it's so weird. 
I mean, honestly, I've seen it. People treat him weirdly because he is David Archer. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but he's a very nice man. I met him today. He's very nice. And Pippa Evans, you know her from Showstoppers? Yep. Yeah. She's very good. She's got a very good part in it, actually. Very good. It's a fantastic lineup in the yes, show, though. Very good lineup. Very good lineup, actually. Now, what would you say are your sort of best and worst gigs you've ever had? Which ones sort of stand out to you and why? Oh, God. Loads of them have been amazingly good. <laughs> No, um, best gig ever. Yeah. I'd say first time I did live at the Apollo, just for sheer excitement, yeah. just for walking out, sheer terror. I hate when you've not done live at the Apollo before. That screen going up and the smoke coming in and walking through that smoke is bloody terrifying. And everybody walks out going, "Yeah, whoa, it's great to be here." Everyone's crapping themselves <laughs> because they know it's going to get repeated ad nauseam. And you know, you've got to yeah. do, you've got to make really hit with that show because that helped my career a lot to be on that. So that was that was the only gig I've gone to bed going. I couldn't sleep. I actually couldn't sleep going, I'm a star. I'm just a massive star. And you can't understand how big a star I am, sort of thing. And the next morning, my wife was going to you know, take the bins out, do the, do the dishwasher. I'm like, do you understand I'm a star? Why is there no smoke on the floor? Yeah, I don't understand. Why do I? Why don't we? Yeah. Um, but you do. That was that moment. And then worst, there's so many terrible gigs when you start. There's so many horrible experiences as a stand-up and all you can do is go through them because, and all you can do is, and you will go through them, but you have to love it enough to go most of the time, it's great. But when it's crap and the audience hates you, there's no way you can prove that you're good because they hate you from that. There is either the setup is wrong. I still can see it sometimes with badly organized corporate gigs where they've gone, oh yeah, get on, you know, there's a big dance floor in front of you and nobody's really there for comedy. That's where you can die like that again. But usually it's when you're new and you're finding your way, Still, if you have more good gigs than bad gigs, you have to hold on to the good gigs. If you're obviously having mainly bad gigs, you're probably not going to make it. But you have to keep holding on to the fact that, you know, someone says to me now, you're not funny. It's just, it doesn't hurt. Only because of the fact of going, well, I make my living doing this. Of course, some people find me funny. And subjectively, loads of people won't find you funny. Subjectively, loads of people will not find a comic funny. But they don't seem to understand when they say you're not funny. They go, well, that's your opinion. I'm not funny to you. To you. But it's but, like music, right? Yeah, exactly. It's just like music. James Blunt is hated by loads of people, sells loads of records as well. And, and it's very funny when people have that you're not funny thing. But when you're new... You're not funny can really hurt because you are. You don't know. Yeah. I'm, am I going to be able to do this or not? So, it is a. It is crap. If you want to get a, get as a comic, don't go. You're not funny because a professional comic, it's not going to hurt us because we've just had too many good nights, which I know annoys you people that don't like us. <laughs> but but it, on a new comic, yeah, you can destroy them by going. You're not funny. You're rubbish. But if you're a new comic and you're having good ones, don't listen to that. So do you know they really hate they hate it when you throw money at them so just do that yeah throw money at them <laughs> notes really annoys them it's yeah. the worst kind of heckle exactly <laughs> so um, you've also been on the Royal Variety performance yes how was that like was that intimidating that's just hilarious I've done it twice yeah. uh, first time I was really unknown so it was it was such a break, it was sort of hilarious. It was yeah. so funny. I remember being in the wings, having my suit, last minute brushed down of my suit, and they're checking my makeup, and I was on stage, and I got the giggles going, this is so funny that I'm on Royal Variety. And I was on after Catherine Jenkins. I said, what she was doing? She was doing her version of Wake Me Up Inside, all this dramatic stuff going on. And the Royal Variety is such a risk for a comic, because I've seen comics die at it. And I luckily have had two really good ones, but you have to get through the first minute of everybody being quite tense. Is this okay for the royals? Is this? I'm not sure. I don't really know this guy. Ooh. And people are tense and worry about you. And if you get through that and it goes well, it's fantastic. And then you get to meet the royals. But the terror of knowing... The, the, the second time round, I was so tense, going, if this goes wrong, I remember what it was like last time, because I remember thinking I'd met the Queen and Prince Philip at my first one. I thought, if that had gone badly, what would that have been like? Tower of London. Yeah. And, well, no, but, but just the very idea that you've got to meet them. And I know a month, the next time I did it, another well-known comic died on his arse because he's kind of young and cool. Um, it wasn't Jack Whitehall. I'm not going to tell you who it was. Um, but it, it really wasn't. I'm just because I said young and cool. But it was a young, cool comic. And those are the ones in danger at Royal Variety. Because Royal, yeah. Royal Variety is for stuffy old fuckers. And I do okay because I'm quite middle aged. Um, so, but, but I. He still had to do the lineup and shake hands. That was Prince Charles and Camilla going, ooh, bad luck to him, you know. <laughs> and then they come, they, they come up. And uh, I, did, I was a massive Republican. Quite like, I'm so shallow. 
I love the royals. I love meeting them. <laughs> I know the system's ridiculous. I know it makes no sense. But they are such nice people to meet. They make you feel so special to go, oh my God, I'm shaking the hands of the most famous family in the world. You know, um, And they are more famous than the Kardashians, whatever people say. They are. They are. Um, so, yes, I'm... I, uh, a royal variety is just magical. It's very, very camp and silly, but it's brilliant to do. And it's, I mean, I remember my kids came to the second one, and my wife and kids were up watching it, and um, watching it live. And I just, I was so tense because I'd known the risk of dying from the first one. Because I'd been, you know, I'd found out that that first minute you have to plow on through, and then you, the audience relaxes and you have a good one. But second time I thought, well, what if it fucks up this time? Oh my God, my kids are in It went so well that I walked off stage and burst into tears of relief. I'd never done that. I walked off stage and went, oh, thank God. Do you think the audience does it too after? Yeah. So that <laughs> thank God he went well. Oh my God, thank God he went well. No, but you did. I had a little moment to myself and the wings going, oh God, I could have died on my arse then. And that would have just been horrendous. Having said that, my kids, I'm always tense when my kids come to see me and they don't give a damn. They, they think it'd be hilarious if I died on my arse at the Royal Variety. They're horrible. It's outrageous. Yeah. So you've also been on Would I Lie to You? And I saw one particular episode where um, you pretended that somebody had kicked a, a ball through the window. Yes. Do you know what? They edit that massively. I didn't have one truth in that show and both times I got picked as true. And I, I was really good. I'm a really good liar, obviously. But yes, I protected somebody who kicked a ball through my window. And the thing is, the main thing is to keep it all as real as possible. Yes. So I used the name of a friend was real. It was his yes. son or something. I was talking about my daughters I was talking about. And I based it all on something that had happened. Actually, when I was a little kid, I'd broken a window at my mum's house. So I think I even described the window, the slats of the window yeah. or something. And that was based on the real, the, like, the house I grew up in. You just put all these little things that are true together and make your lie and it's and easy I, to remember too right yeah and would i lie to you it's a lovely show to do it's a proper show because you also there's no preparation on other shows you all go prepared going i'm going to wheedle this joke in here and that would i lie to you you don't you literally don't know you're getting that card and going i've got to really? lie yeah you don't know what the lie is going to be till you turn the card so over. they tell you your lie no but your lie is hal what do you have to tell us i am don't they and you lift up a card and you don't know you don't know if you're getting a truth or a lie, I don't think, you know, until you turn it over. So you, you don't, if it's a lie, you don't know what the lie is in advance? No, no. Oh, wow. you have no so idea. So really, it's like full-on improv? It is full-on improv, but it's also, it's also improving with the best natural comedians in the world. I mean, Rob Bryden, Lee Mack, David Mitchell are the best off-the-cuff, raconteur, yeah. funny people. I've toured with Rob Bryden for a year. He's such good value. You can sit there and have dinner with him and friends joined us once for dinner in Nottingham, I think it was. And I was just so proud of him because he was like, oh, come for dinner. And he just went, and he just tells stories that are so funny. And weirdly, he does less stand-up than someone like me and I'm much more sort of tight and, ooh, you know, and a bit cutting. He just tells a story and he's, very, he's naturally a very funny man, Rob Bryden. Very funny. He looks funny, <laughs> isn't he? <laughs> The Welsh accent. It might be the Welsh accent and being slightly short. Anyway, no, that's very unfair. He's got so many things going for him, though. Like. Yeah, he has. He's brilliant. He's a very nice man. So you've been on uh, many different shows over the years. Um, is there any that you'd like to do? For example, would you like to be on Love Island? Or <laughs> God. Um, no, because I, I don't watch Love Island, but I said to my kids, should I do this? <laughs> I wasn't asked to do it, obviously. And they went, yeah, it'd be hilarious, Daddy, if you went on little fat middle-aged man. Um, what shows do I really want to do? I'd love to be on a sitcom on TV. I've and I've never had a good, I've never had a sitcom job. My sister's an actor, as well, and she's in like she's actually in Not Going Out at the moment. She's Hugh, do you watch Not Going Out? Lena? Yeah, of course. She is. My, my sister is Hugh Dennis's oh, well, wife. You know, amazing. Anna. Yeah. Yeah. So she gets all she gets those jobs. She's not a stat. I'm a, I'm the comic, um, and uh, she gets really good jobs in sitcoms. My sister and I'm always like, I'd love to be in a sitcom. I'd love my my radio sitcom to have gone to telly. One day I'll write something. I'd love to do a sitcom. Um, I don't particularly. There's nothing else I really crave doing. I'd love to do some documentary of me travelling around the world. Because I just, if you put a camera in front of me for long enough, I'm really funny if you can edit it right. <laughs> Literally, film me for 24 hours and you'll get an hour's show out of <laughs> There you go. It's worth doing. Yeah. So anyway, if you were to do a travel sort of thing, would you? where would you like to go? I'd like to retrace a trip I did when I was 18. 
I did a very safe little round the world trip for five and a half months. I went to um, I went to Hong Kong, Bali. Yeah. It's all very nothing very exciting, no nothing dangerous. Austra- yeah. A little bit of Australia for only three weeks, then Canada, and I went round the coast of America, down the bottom to the deep south, back up to New York and uh, Boston, and then into Canada again, and went home from Toronto. And I did this weird loop that. I just would quite like to go back to some of those places and think, because I was so impressed by everything when I was 18. I think I'd go back and be quite cynical. But Trump would have to leave power because I can't go to America while Trump's in power. I find the whole, he's degraded the whole nation. (laughs) He has a bit, hasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sort of sitting out till he leaves and then I'll go back again. See, I say I'm not going... I don't have any work there. <laughs> so if, yeah. you know, when I say to people, boycott America, you can't ask James Corden to do that. He's got his big work there. You know, comics who are doing, if I had a job there, I'd be over there. Like somebody said, oh, so you're not going to do a Hollywood film, Hal, because of Trump. Of course I'd be over there. So, yeah. Just while you're not doing anything there, have it known you're boycotting them. I'm boycotting America, but don't. This does, does this not go to Hollywood in case somebody last minute offer? This is where it goes. This is for them. Well, that's why I'm not getting any Hollywood offers. But you will now, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Probably going to get a lovely sitcom. Yeah, probably get a lovely sitcom and they'll say, sorry, we can't use you because of Trump. Anyway. <laughs> It'll be fine. <laughs> um, so your uh, two of your previous shows are out on DVD and uh, available on things like Amazon Prime and um, Next Up Comedy as yes. well. What's that, what's that available on? Is that just its own thing, Next Up Comedy? So that's very, um, you can't get that through Amazon or anything, can you? It sort of is through Amazon. Oh, There's like, yeah, so you can, because I subscribe to it actually, so you can watch on a few devices and different things. See, I've never seen, I've seen one of them all the way through to check it. Mm. The one, the first one, and the second one, I can't bear watching myself so much yeah. that I won't see them. So I'm like, uh, so I, it's very funny when people get, you know, it's very hard to watch yourself. So I should watch, I should watch the next one because I think that's the better one. The second one, straight out of Cruttenden, is my best show ever, I think. But yeah. I've got the same thing. I don't watch my things back, which is a problem because I also edit them. So I have to do it without looking. And yeah, I, I don't really know what happens. It's horrible, isn't it? I think, and people weirdly think people that do this, that appear on screen or anything, that we're very vain. And maybe we are very vain, but we really despise ourselves. It's not just the look. You despise the voice, you despise the mannerisms, the sheer hatred, the sheer, sheer psychological damage of people in showbiz. I write most of my own abuse online. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I once, I put it in the show, but I once got, I once picked up, um, it wasn't me that did this, I once picked up a thing on Twitter that said, saw Hal Crunton at Live at the Apollo, bit boring, turned over. And my daughter came up, stood beside me and said, that's not very nice, who wrote that, Daddy? I looked at it, it was from her. Oh, no. She did it deliberately to wind me up. She, she trolled my own, she was only about 13 at the time, trolled me on Twitter. That's shocking. The sort of love my kids have for me. Disgusting. Now, I've been having a bit of a look into your, your next show, and it covers some really heavy topics, apparently, because it's called Chubster. Yeah. <laughs> it is called Chubster, but it does cover heavy heavy, tropic, yeah. heavy topics. All my shows, I tend to do them as always, all light and fluffy, but I've got so much death in my shows. Yeah. I always talk about death. I think it's because I'm middle-aged. I do talk about weight. I talk a lot about my kids, I think. And I do get into things, I get into weird things, like talking about why I love the Queen. I mention politics, but I'm so middle of the road, it's disgusting. I like the Queen, I talk about loving the Queen, why I can't be a unilateral disarmer about nuclear weapons. Honestly, I do comedy about this. Um, And I'm so middle of the road, and I'm a bit of a Remainer, but that's not even radical, that's 48% of the country. So I've just realized my politics is, I have, I just am not that out there. I'm, I'm a centrist dad, I think they call us. The Corbynistas call people like me a centrist dad. We're sort of lefties, but we're not really, we're not really living it. We're very like, oh, you know, got to protect big business a bit. Oh, but maybe raise taxes a bit. Oh, maybe should we look after people a bit more? It's yeah. pathetic. I should do, I should, I'm doing a run through my show tomorrow. I should remember that feeling because I will do a big rant to myself for going, I wish I was a kind of leather jacket, slick back hair, fuck this man, kind of, you know, those American comics that kind of, yeah, because they want to kill him and all that sort of stuff. I just can't do that. Sorry. It is, it's less stressful, I suppose, as well. You're less angry at things. I am angry, though. You are angry, but I you're just, more civil with it. Uh, yeah, I'm angry, but I'm just too reasonable. Yeah. I can't. 
I can't go. It's just that horrible aging thing. You know, I, I was very left wing when I was younger. And now I just think, oh, let's not upset everyone. Let's not have a revolution. People get hurt, you know. But, you know, it's nice to have a bit of that, though, just to get along more, you know. Yeah, exactly. I think we need more of that, whether you're on the left or the right or the middle. Oh, exactly. At the moment, you just feel, I can't join those two extreme camps that yeah. hate each other. I can't hate someone for being a Tory when I'm not a Tory. You know, I'm, yeah. I've always been vaguely left wing. But I don't hate people for being Tories. Some people actually think someone's evil yeah. for being a Tory. You, you can't say that. There's some lovely people I know. There's some lovely people who voted Leave, but there's Remainers going, I hate them. And, yeah. and Leavers voting, Remainers, you're naive, you're idiots, you're posers. No, they're just not. They're just, most people are in the middle making choices based on small variations. And most people are nice. I, I think sometimes people always want to divide people into different categories. You know, rival cities don't like each other, they should be thinking their neighbours. Well, we've got Portsmouth, Southampton, haven't yeah. we? Which is laughable because the rest of the country goes, you're two cities on the coast. You they've both, got, yeah. they've both got some very nice shopping centres and restaurants. I, nice, I do like the South Coast, actually. Yeah. I really do. I say that with all honesty. There are horrible parts of this country. The South Coast is nice. It's very nice. So what can, what can people expect from your new show? Just hilarity, brilliance, middle-aged man having a breakdown. But there's also stuff for the kids. Um, <laughs> no, I, I don't know, really. I really don't know how to sum up when people ask you what did you do for show, I go, well, topics include, you know, obviously a lot on being chubby, a lot on my daughters taking the piss out of me, but for with an interesting angle, a lot on death. I describe my perfect funeral. I describe my l most hated, this funeral I fear the most, which is incidentally my agent's funeral, because if your agent dies, you're devastated, but because of the nature of it then being an agent, the funeral will be full of industry you need to schmooze to get new representation so my, my agent's about a couple of years older than me hopefully <laughs> i will die before him i hope he's not in great condition though he's like me so hopefully he's okay and the thing is all the comics are going to want to do the eulogy to get the attention and mickey flanagan's going to get it because he's the biggest yeah. act and he doesn't need it because he can he, he can easily get representation he plays arenas so yeah and, um, what have you got coming up next coming up next is very much this show it's very much doing my tour edinburgh then a tour starting in September, bits and bobs of TV as usual, be bits like The Apprentice You're Fired, hopefully Bake Off, hopefully a live at the Apollo. Oh, none of this is definite, by the way, the live at the Apollo isn't anyway. The Apprentice, they said I'm part of the family, The Apprentice You're Fired, so they'll have me on that. Um, I've got, I've recorded some, you'll, I'll be popping up on some celebrity quiz shows. <laughs> I've got a couple of them. Celebrity Chase, oh, I think you'll find. I don't think I'm giving away too much. Me, Nikki Campbell, Edwina Curry. Oh, yes. That, I don't know when that's coming out. These go, they go out whenever. Um, I think I'm on Eggheads. I'm on Celebrity Are Eggheads you? as well. They like me on quiz shows. Yeah. yeah, because I get very competitive. And I get very, very driven. Yeah. It's like I was trying to interview someone else just now and you knocked them out of the way and you just jumped on the seat. I did. Yeah. I did. I'm like that. Very, very pushy. <laughs> it's why a limited talent has got this far. Absolutely. Well, Hal, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Thank you so much. Have you got any messages for um, people watching the Sarah O'Connell show and people around the world? Uh, is, is this really go around the world? Yeah, the internet's around the world, isn't it? Probably got one friend in America that might watch it. Yeah, just be nice to each other. And, um, oh, the American, I'm so sorry. I hope that he goes soon. <laughs> Absolutely, because he's, he's constipated. Is that what you meant? Exactly, yes. Oh, oh there's no... I, mean, uh, <laughs> I hope you remain regular. I like the way you were lowering it. I was keeping it to a high political level about Trump going, you see. Oh. Is that? But I like the way you took it literally. Thank you. Did you not think of what I was talking about? Yeah, no, I knew. I just thought it'd be funny. Oh, it was funny. You are really funny, and you. so are you, oh, by the way. Do a show, so I'm very literal. Yeah. Yeah, but you took it and you pl ran with it. Sorry. I thought I should. I thought I should add something to it's, this. It's not unlike sitting next to Lee Mack on Would I Lie to You and just funny, funny, funny. And you go, I should have thought of that. Exactly. Great stuff. You, you can claim it as yours if you want. I'm going to use it. You should. Yeah. <laughs> I get commission though. Yeah. <laughs> So um, thank you very much um, for your time. Thank you for everybody watching at home. Be sure to share, subscribe, give the video a big thumbs up and I'll see you all again soon for another episode of the Sarah O'Connell Show. Bye. Bye.